I can't hear anything. Well, today, guys, we're going to talk about sounds that our ears make, which I can't seem to hear. And we're going to talk about hair cells, which are not the cells making the beautiful hair coming out of Andrea's head, but cells that are inside of our ears. So let's get started. So what are these weird sounds coming out of our ears? Well, after my last video talking about the ear, my uncle reached out to me and he told me that it was a little unclear what was happening with hair cells. So I figured I would dive a little deeper and I just happened to stumble upon these things called otoacoustic emissions, which I just thought were so cool. So what are they exactly? What do they have to do with hair cells? And how did we discover them? Let's find out. One of the first people to notice these was actually a musician. Back in the 1700s, a violinist and composer named Giuseppe Tarquini noticed that when he played double stops or two notes at once on his Stradivarius violin, a faint third note emerged that was significantly lower in pitch. Tarquini used this terzo suono, or third sound, as a way to perfect his intonation. And for those interested, you should definitely check out his Devil's Trill Sonata, which contains many double stops and is very technically impressive. Today, we know this mysterious third sound as a distortion product otoacoustic emission. So if we have two frequencies, we can call them F1 and F2. And if F2 is greater than F1 and we play them at once, one of the distortion products will be F2 minus F1 which is the Tartini tone. If we think about this with notes, we can play F1 as C sharp and F2 as the next higher A. The Tartini tone would be the E lower than the C sharp. Written musically, it looks like this. I'll demonstrate this for you on my violin. Just kidding. These tones are best detected when you're using two pure tones as input and when intonation is precise. So I'm not going to make you sit through me trying to find that precision. Instead, I'll put some links below where you can hear this. It wasn't until 1948 that a mechanism for this phenomenon was proposed by an astrophysicist named Thomas Gold at Cambridge University. Definitely check out this dude. He has a fascinating story and an accomplished life. And an interesting aside is that he tried to persuade Carl Sagan Swoon, to join the faculty of Cornell. And after Sagan was denied tenure at Harvard, Gold hired him. I already like Gold because he clearly loves Carl Sagan like I do. Gold postulated that the cochlea contained some sort of amplification system that allowed the huge range of auditory events to be represented by the minuscule elements of the inner ear. His hypothesis was disregarded until the 1970s when physicist David Kemp began to explore cochlear function and discovered otoacoustic emissions, or sounds produced by the inner ear. Kemp fed sounds and clicks into the ears of different animals, including humans, and was able to record sounds coming out of the ear in response to these stimuli. Since this discovery, otoacoustic emissions, and particularly distortion product otoacoustic emissions, have been used in diagnostic tests to assess outer hair cell integrity. However, when used in these tests, audiologists tend to focus on a different distortion product than the Tartini tone. Instead, they track the cubic difference tone, represented by 2 times F1 minus F2, which is the most prominent distortion product when the input tones are at a ratio of 1 to 1.22. So, if F1 is at 1000 Hz, then F2 will be at 1200 Hz. The cubic difference tone would be 2000 minus 1200, or 800 Hz. So a microphone placed inside the ear canal would record a very soft tone at 800 Hz, or somewhere between a G and G sharp. There are many types of otoacoustic emissions, even ones that just happen spontaneously. Say we put someone in a very quiet room and stick a microphone in their ear. We may hear some of these otoacoustic emissions. The classification of otoacoustic emissions is still evolving as we learn more, but given their close relationship with music, 
We'll stick with Distortion Product Odo Acoustic Emissions today. So why are Odo Acoustic Emissions important? Besides the cool ghostly tones they produce, or their use in non-behavioral hearing tests. Autoacoustic emissions are important because they're evidence that the cochlea is an amplifier. <laughs> like this. And the amplification that happens inside of the cochlea not only boosts the signal, but it increases frequency specificity. So this is what allows us to distinguish a voice amongst a crowd or a lot of background noise. It enables us to hear very faint sounds. And it also allows us to distinguish between frequencies that are really close together, making our ears more precise. And this is key for speech processing, which is a fundamental human characteristic. And for those of us that are violinists, this property is trained almost to the point of annoyance. How is this accomplished inside the cochlea? Well, this is a very hot topic in hearing science and it's still up for debate, but it seems to be in part accomplished by the outer hair cells. Recall that we have inner hair cells and outer hair cells that sit on top of the basal or membrane. The inner hair cells, which we will talk about more in depth another time, are arranged in a single row and they are mostly responsible for sending the final transduction of mechanical energy into neural signal to the cochlear nerve that goes into the brain. The outer hair cells, however, are arranged in rows of three. They are connected to afferent fibers or fibers that go into the brain, but they also have efferent connections or fibers coming out of the brain. They are connected in this way to the brain stem where they are under some central control. So we know that the basal or membrane by its very nature vibrates in response to incoming sound. We know that it's tonotopic and that certain locations along the basal or membrane respond to specific frequencies. And this is a passive mechanism. In fact, if we look at basal or membranes from corpses and we stimulate them with sound, they still vibrate. However, this isn't enough to explain our amazing ability to isolate a particular sound amidst noise or our incredible frequency specificity. And if we look at basal or membranes from living people and compare them to those from corpses, they are much more active. So we know that there's some active process happening somewhere. And that somewhere seems to be in the outer hair cells in their stereocilia, which are the little hairs on top of the cell. So we know that when a particular tone, in this case a C-sharp, enters the ear, it will be represented by a traveling wave down the basal or membrane. When that wave reaches the part of the basal or membrane that matches the resonant frequency, or where it vibrates the most, that's when the outer hair cells will start to work their magic. Now the environment outside the cells is really special and unique because it has a high concentration of potassium ions, making it really positively charged. The inside of the outer hair cells is at a much lower voltage and is negative. So when sound stimulates hair cells, this causes the stereocilia to then become displaced. And as you can see here, there's like a little thread linking these stereocilia and they're attached to what you could consider a little door, or we call them ion channels. And when the stereocilia are displaced like this, this opens those doors of those ion channels, and this allows ions to rush in. Things like potassium, calcium, and sodium, and they come into the cell and they cause the cell environment to become depolarized or more positive. And when this happens, this change or this force causes these little proteins here called prestin to cause the cell to lengthen and shorten like this. So it looks like it's moving. 
And brilliantly, some researchers were actually able to record this, and I'll link the video below of dancing hair cells. You should really check it out because they're super cool. And now that I'm thinking about it, I really love cells and I really love dancing, so I think I might be an outer hair cell for Halloween this year. Hmm. Another way to think about this is considering resonant frequency, or the frequency at which the material is going to vibrate the most. I will link a helpful video below about this in which Dr. Peggy Mason at the University of Chicago gives many helpful examples. One example is when a soprano singer sings a note at a very high frequency, which is the resonant frequency of glass, and the glass shatters. This is because the singer is feeding more energy into the system, enhancing the effect. Essentially, the outer hair cells are feeding energy into the system at the resonant frequency of that little portion of basilar membrane and amplifying the signal that eventually gets passed to the inner hair cells into the brain. So when we have two tones, for example, like this, that are being amplified, there's going to be distortion. As with any amplifier, there's distortion. And this distortion takes the form of otoacoustic emissions. And these distortion products actually do vibrate the basilar membrane at their respective frequency locations. And we perceive this as sound, like tartini tones. And even though the mechanism of transference of these sounds from the cochlea back out the ear is still debatable, we know that some of these distortion products do make their way out as sounds that our inner ears make. Some musicians and composers like Jacob Kierkegaard, Phil Noblock, and Marian Ambacher have caught wind of this phenomenon and have utilized and manipulated it to compose music. I'll link their works below so you can hear the eerie nature of our musical inner ears as instruments themselves. So of course, there are many more aspects to this topic and we can go into much greater complexity than I can fit into this video. Uh, so if you're interested, I'll put some sources below. Check them out. Thank you so much for exploring this topic with me today. Please leave your questions and any feedback below. If you've enjoyed this video and want to see more content like this, please subscribe. And if you want me to do any deeper dives into any particular topics, please reach out and let me know. In the meantime, happy sciencing and happy musicking. Ciao.